Hello and welcome to my channel. In this video I'll be discussing King's Dragon by Kate Elliott, the first book in the Crown of Stars series. Now this book I came across at my local used bookstore and I, I thought that the series seemed interesting. It's kind of a interesting, you know, design as you can see there with everything on it. And I thought it seemed interesting, but they never had the first book in the series. So I kept waiting. Finally, I decided I was just going to try and buy it online, went through this whole fiasco with an online merchant. And then I was about to just give up when I found out they actually then had it at the local bookstore. Finally, so I was able to get started on the series. King's Dragon embeds us into a world not quite unlike our own, but of course with a lot of fantastical touches put in there. We're introduced into a very medieval world where religion's at the forefront, sorcery is frowned upon or even considered heresy depending on the situation, a civil wars primed rage between different factions, and the not quite human Ica are raiding from the north causing lots of problems as well. Now that description may make it sound like this book is going to be action-packed, so I do want to address very early on something that will probably be a little bit polarizing about this book, and that is the overall writing style and the pacing. The book was published in the late 90s, so it isn't super old. He tells himself to not feel old. But it does very much have a classic fantasy feel. Uh, I wouldn't call the pacing necessarily slow, it's just more extremely deliberate. Kate Elliott, the author, knows exactly what she wants to accomplish, and she uses every paragraph, every sentence almost, that has a very deliberate point in what she is trying to get across. The author clearly did a lot of research on medieval times, religions and how they spread, and just even the everyday life, and so all of these details really shine through, and it was something that I really enjoyed. This book was only about 500 pages long, but it actually felt almost like reading a book twice as long, which believe it or not, I actually mean in a really good way. There was just such a depth to the world that it's something you just really don't see that much, especially early on. And really you are thrust very deeply into this world right at the beginning. This book is seven books long, which is a good deal longer than we normally see. We see a lot more trilogies these days. So the world that's being set up here is very, very large. And so I think this is something that's needed. And I do think the pacing will pick up later on too as well with it. Um, I just really, I enjoy taking a step back and reading something with more world building in it as well. Obviously my love of uh, The Wheel of Time uh, I, I do love world building and finding out all of these details, but King's Dragon really does more world building than I've ever successfully seen in any fantasy book in a first book, and yes, that even does include The Wheel of Time. Getting into the actual plot, because I've talked enough about the world building, we mostly follow two characters that we have a few other POVs here and there. The first is Elaine, who is a young boy who was supposed to be given to the church, but due to events that take place, he is now going to be sent to be a man at arms and fight for the local lord. And through Elaine's interactions, we do learn a lot about the history, and especially about the church. It makes sense considering he was always told as soon as he was aged, that's where he was going to go. So it lets us see a lot of what's happening. And his experience does play a little bit to the classic trope of the young boy, the mysterious parentage becomes a hero type thing. But there are a lot of unique twists that really change it up on that trope. And in fact, his feelings uh, just generally being powerless play a lot more into his character than any other parts of him. The second main character we follow is Leith, and she is the daughter of a sorcerer, her mother, who died many years before, and her father, who dabbled in sorcery. And they've been essentially on the run from these unknown, unseen enemies for many years. After it finally all catches up to them and her father is killed, she ends up being sold into slavery to cover his deaths and bought by a man of the church, Hugh. And this is where we delve into a much darker plot line. Leith's plotline does, for a time, seem like it's going to fall very hard into cliché, but Elliot once again uses something familiar, uh, this kind of situation and something we've seen in other fantasy and that's been overused in some ways, but makes it unique and adds twists to it and uses this familiar thing to introduce you to something that ends up being very different. 
Uh, the story of Leith ends up being a lot more complex than just that simple cliche, but those experiences do have a really big impact on her and the character that she's starting to become later in this book as well. Lyoth, more than anything, though, wants to protect the Book of Secrets that she inherited from her father that are all his knowledge of sorcery and more, and this really delves us deeper into the other side of the coin. With Elaine, we learned a lot more about the church and of that side, and with Lyoth, she's completely on the outside and learning these mystical things, and sets up quite a lot of mystery going forward with what's going to be happening with her as well. And she hopes to one day be able to understand it and use the power, but she knows so, so little uh, about it at the point where we see the actual storyline taking place. Around these characters, we also learn so much of the world around them, including different places, different races of people. There's just so much depth, like I talked on earlier, and I'm not gonna start going on and on about it again. But for example, we learn about the Aoi, who are called the Lost Ones, who are elves that apparently are not really seen much anymore, that they used to uh, be more involved with humanity. We learn of many other groups of people and cultures and different areas. And we even see kind of the everyday people that may follow the main religion openly, but still have these other beliefs in the, their local spirits or these different things. and just kind of the attention to detail to these very small things, how if one character is in one area and another character is in somewhere else, those people are going to be a little bit different. Their traditions, their beliefs are going to be a little bit different, especially in a medieval world where information is slow to move around and it's the little touches just really made this so enjoyable to read for me. Speaking of the religion, I've mentioned a couple of times, it has a very firm base in Catholicism, but it really does branch out through there. Like I said, you see some characters who kind of follow it a little bit, but also follow their own things, and you also see that different members of the church have very wildly different ideas of what the religion means and what different things mean as well. It plays a massive part, and we can really see that it's going to be incredibly important throughout. The big difference between the main religion, Catholicism, though, is at its core the fact that there's not one male presence who is God, but there are two presences, one male, one female, which really shows how very different that makes society look at. Because there's a male and a female God, and they're equals, they're together, and that's how they rule, we see that there really isn't sexism, that's a thing. There are still things that are expected of men and expected of women, but it's not one less important than the other, and we see that women can fight, women can join the church, uh, in fact many hold really high positions of power, and so it's an interesting look into how that religious structure affects the world around them, and is something that's explored quite a lot in the first book also. It gives you something so different from a lot of the medieval settings as well, just based on that one change to the religion. And I do just want to comment one more time on the medieval setting. I will be the first person to admit, I know a medieval setting isn't exactly the most uh, <laughs> new idea. It's been something that has been used and used and used to death. But Elliot here doesn't just use the medieval setting and then go from there. She obviously, like I mentioned, has done a lot of research and has worked to really make this feel so real. And the way it's written, you can almost believe this is a real world and that these fantasy elements just also happen to be real also. But even smaller details, things that are so easy to miss and most people won't even point out to you, like the number of people in battles, the number of soldiers a lord can reasonably call to fight, is there's attention paid, it's realistic. We see one of the largest battle involves like 800 people, uh, including both sides, because the rest of the lords, they couldn't get everyone from these distant cities and have levies done, and it's so often we just like, get, get the armies, let's go, and it's normal. But it, it's, it's a lot more realistic the way that this book looks at it, and it's once again these really small details that are just so, so well done. Really for me, it was the detail-oriented approach that made the book just so enjoyable. I really liked being able to just kind of step back and slowly delve into this world and read a fantasy book like this. It's just not something you see that much anymore. And there's certainly nothing wrong with the kind of newer, more popular, action-packed style of fantasy. It tends to be darker, a lot more going on. I've enjoyed a lot of 
the really action-packed, fast-paced fantasy, but I also really enjoyed stepping back into this classic feeling fantasy world, and I really think the base that was set here is going to make for a very fantastic series overall with The Crown of Stars, so I'm excited to keep going. I do think the characters were well written also. In some ways they didn't have a lot of their story really brought up. There are six more books. I think they're both going to continue to grow, but we saw through their interactions the things that they said, kind of who they are as characters, and also there were some things that were clearly set up to have other side characters be a lot more important later on. So I think once again the, the world building really was the focus for this book, really getting everything set up, and I think we'll see a lot more growth of characters and additional amounts and faster paced plot lines in the coming books, so that certainly will remain to be seen. That said, if you, like me, do love digging into a deep world, you love extensive world building, this is most certainly a book for you. And if you are one of those people who is really more driven by either characters or fast-paced action, this probably is not going to be the best book for you because of the fact that it's slower. Now, like I said, I do expect more character growth uh, and, and faster pace in general a little bit to happen in the next books, but this first book, I think, does what it wanted to accomplish and does it very, very well. And once again, if you're a reader like me, I do think this is something I would recommend. I am excited to continue with the series, and I have high hopes now. Uh, hopefully I'm not getting my hopes up too high, but I have high hopes for the rest of the series. With that, that's my review of King's Dragon. Uh, as always, let me know your thoughts. Like I commented before, I think this will be a bit more polarizing with opinions uh, based on reading the first book, so I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. But if you like this video, then feel free to give it a like, and if you'd like to see more of my content, then feel free to subscribe.